So today we continue our lesson, our worship series, on, uh, based on Barbara Brown Taylor's An Altar in the World on Spiritual Practices uh, for 2022, based on her book. Today we tackle the practice of paying attention and how God sends us wonderful and awful and holy interruptions to wake us up and to keep us paying attention. So let us pray. Oh God, we are so busy and preoccupied, focused on our own agendas that we walk sightless among miracles, miracles of life and love and beauty. So startle us, interrupt us to your presence all around us, and open our hearts and minds to the word you have for us today. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So we're going to start out with a game. How many of you are playing Wordle? I'm not going to make you play Wordle, but isn't it fun? Like, I like that you only have to do one a day, right? So you can't get obsessive about it, but it's fun. I haven't done it today, so don't tell me the answer. Um, but we're going to have a little fun this morning. I'm going to ask you to take a test. Don't worry, we grade on a curve. So, um, so I'm going to show you a short video, and in it you will see some basketball players. Some are wearing black uniforms and some are wearing white. And as you watch the video, I want you to count how many passes the white, the team in white makes. Um, so you got it? How many passes the team in white makes? Hit it, Rick. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? How many? Everybody got 13? Maybe 13 and a half? Maybe 13 and a half? All right, let's find out the answer. The answer is 13. But did you see the moonwalking bear? It's easy to miss something you're not looking for, right? It's easy to miss. It's so true. Most of us hurry our way through life, full of agendas and to-do lists. We pay attention only to our phones or our watches or our speedometers. And we love our well-ordered plans, don't we? Our lists and our agendas. From morning to night, we just go. And we hate it when something comes into our lives to interrupt our plans. I mean, show of hands, be honest, how many of you push the elevator button even after it's already been pushed? How many of you? Yeah, right? How many of you get into the express line at the grocery store and start counting the number of items that person in front of you has <laughs> on the belt, right? Sometimes we are so busy and purpose-driven that we wouldn't notice a moonwalking bear walking across our path, much less a burning bush, much less God. And yet I believe that God is constantly 
interrupting us, interrupting our well-ordered plans, our well-ordered lives in the best possible way if we would just pay attention. Henry Nouwen, a Catholic priest and writer, um, once said that my whole life I have been complaining that my work is constantly being interrupted, that I, that I couldn't get anything done because of all the interruptions. Until, he said, until I discovered that my interruptions are my work. It turns out that the Bible is full of God's interruptions. Mary, Jesus' mother, um, being visited by an angel. Jesus visiting the Samaritan woman at the well and interrupting her noonday um, gathering of water. Mary Magdalene at Jesus' tomb. Paul on the road to Damascus. The Good Samaritan was interrupted on his travels on the road to Jericho to show mercy to his neighbor. Jesus is forever being interrupted on his way to do something else. In fact, most of Jesus' most important ministry begins with an interruption, with a storm or a demon or a person in need of healing. And Jesus embraces them all. The Bible is full of interruptions, but we don't always recognize that God is present in our own interruptions. In fact, I think a lot of us walk past burning bushes in our lives without even giving them a second glance. It's easy to miss something we found. It's easy to miss something we're not looking for. I mean, Moses could have been focused on his sheep herding mission, his five-step plan for keeping track of his sheep, on what he needed to do and where he needed to be. And instead, the text tells us that he turns aside to see it. And it's weird, you know, the, the bush, it burns without, the text tells us, without being consumed. Rabbis note that it takes some time, maybe five or ten minutes, for a bush to burn to the ground. And so here's an interesting point. When I was looking at this text, text it was only after... God saw that Moses had stood long enough to notice that the bush hadn't been burned up, hadn't been consumed. To check it out, it's only after Moses sit, stands there long enough to check it out. Only then does God call out to him from the bush. It's not until he fixes his full attention that God addresses him. Only then, it seems, is he worthy of God's call. I mean, think about it. What would you have done? You're busy. You've got things to do. You've got sheep to tend, things to check off your to-do list. I mean, those sheep aren't going to tend themselves. Moses could have decided that he would come back tomorrow to see if the bush was still burning when he had a little bit more time. But you see, I think God wants us to hold our gaze. God wants us to notice God. God wants us to pay attention. I think that's precisely how God loves. There's this wonderful scene in one of my favorite books, um, and later it was a movie starring Oprah Winfrey. It's called The Color Purple. Have, have, have you all read it or seen it? The Color Purple. It's a deeply theological story, and the main character, Celie, is working out her own relationship 
with God and with the world throughout the book. And at the culmination of the book, and the part I remember really vividly, is the scene where Celie is talking to her friend, Suge, about God. Here's the thing, Suge says, the thing I believe. God is inside you and inside everybody else. You come into the world with God, Suge says, but only them that search for it inside find it. And sometimes it just manifests itself even if you're not looking or don't know what you're looking for. So her friend Celie tells her own burning bush story. She says, one day when I was sitting quiet and feeling like a motherless child, which I was, it came to me. That feeling of being a part of everything and not separate at all. I knew that if I cut a tree, my arm would bleed. And so you know what I did? I laughed and I cried and I ran all around the house. I knew just what it was. In fact, when it happens, you can't miss it. So Stug replies to her, God loves, God loves all them feelings. That's some of the best stuff God did. More than anything else, God loves admiration. Is God vain? Seely asks. Nah, not vain, just wanting to share a good thing. And then finally this. She says, I think it ticks God off if you walk by the color purple in a field somewhere and don't notice it. God wants us to notice her or him to be in the moment. Barbara Brown Taylor calls it the practice of paying attention. The practice of paying attention is as simple as looking twice at people and things you might just easily ignore. To really see takes time, like having a friend takes time. It is as simple as turning off the television to learn the song of a bird. Why should anyone do these things? She writes, I can't imagine unless you are weary of crossing the days off the calendar with no sense of what makes the last day different from the next. Unless you are weary of acting in what feels more like a television commercial than a life. This practice, the practice of paying attention, is the way into a different sort of life, full of treasure for those who are willing to pay attention to exactly where they are. You see, not every interruption from God you'll encounter will be a burning bush or even a smoldering houseplant. But I think we need to cultivate our curiosity, our sense of wonder, our attention to the world around us and the interruptions to our own agendas. Because that's how, I think, God tells us what he wants, what she needs. That's how God speaks. Presbyterian writer Fred Beekner said, the sacred moments, the moments of miracle, are often everyday moments. The moments which, if we do not look with more than our eyes, or listen with more than our ears, will reveal only a gardener at the tomb, or a stranger coming down the road behind us, or a meal like any other meal. But he says, oh my friends, if we look with our hearts, if we listen with our being and our imagination, what we may see is Jesus himself. Bree Stoner was a, a harried and busy young parent with a nine-month-old and a toddler at home. When she enrolled in some classes to learn about prayer and contemplative 
uh, practices in order to better encounter God in her daily life. Some of you have been there, a baby and a toddler. Some of you are there. Some of us remember those days. She was working hard at these contemplative retreats, hoping for a meaningful encounter with God. Um, These retreats where she was away from her family and responsibility. But she found it much harder when she went home and she was amidst all the interruptions of her busy young family. Many of us who have had or have now young children know what that's like. She was longing for a true connection with God and she found that it was much easier when she was at the retreat center where meals were provided and dishes were picked up and magically washed by someone that was not her. Where she slept in a hotel bed without ever needing to share it with a little one where she could walk amidst the grounds in quiet solitude. But she found it much harder when she got back home. And so finally she asked her teacher, her mentor, Jim Finley, she said, Jim, can we talk about how much harder all of this is when I'm back home? Sometimes I set my alarm for 5 a.m., desperate to have some time for quiet prayer, and it's like my kids have radar, and inevitably one of them wakes up 10 minutes later, and I mean, where is the icon of the mystic with a baby on her lap and a toddler crying at her feet, cooking dinner with one hand and trying to finish work on a laptop with the other? Because that's my life. And so her mentor, Jim, had a wonderful exercise for her. He told her, okay, let's pretend that you are you and I'll be God. He said, since I'm God, I'm watching you get up exhausted every morning. And I'm so touched that you want to spend this time with me. Really, I am. And it just means the world to me. But the thing is, I just can't bear, I, God, can't bear how much I love you. It's too much. And so at a certain point, I rush into the bodies of your children and wake them up because... He said, because I, God, want to know what it feels like to be held by you. She concludes, you see, the interruptions are the presence of God that I was so desperately trying to access in the moments of stillness and silence with or without the luxury of stillness and silence, God comes to us, she says, disguised disguised as our very lives. Jim had helped her discover that her path as an exhausted young parent was the way of transformation, the way of encountering God. If she learned to let her heart open enough she realized that she just might begin to recognize each cry, each diaper change, each playtime request, all of it, as the startling, stunning infusion of infinite love colliding into the small shape of her very finite and ordinary reality. She said, there at the intersection of everything is God with us. God wanting to know us and love us and be held by us. All we have to do is pay attention. All we have to do is open our eyes. But the truth, friends, is we do miss what we're not looking for. We walk right past burning bushes and moonwalking bears all the time. We walk right on past Christ himself. So if we start paying attention, we will begin, I think, to see God all around us in the lives of others, in our conversations, in our neighbors in need. I will leave the last word for Barbara Brown Taylor, she writes, like all other spiritual practices, 
Paying attention requires no equipment, no special clothing, no greens fees, or special personal trainers. You do not have to be a particular, in particularly good shape. All you need, all you need is a body on this earth willing to notice where it is and trusting that even something as small as a hazelnut can become an altar in the world. Amen.